So I'm sitting here with Adam Sud, and uh, I had actually heard a couple interviews with him, and we connected online, and just wanted to say, Adam, first off, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. You've got an incredible story, and uh, maybe you could just uh, start off by saying where you live, where you're from, and uh, a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, uh, thank you for having me on the show, um, and uh, yeah. My name is Adam Sutt. I live in Santa Monica, California, but I'm originally from uh, Texas. I was born in Houston. I'm like seventh generation Houstonian. Um, but I grew up in Austin, Texas. And uh, yeah, right now I work in uh, addiction recovery. And um, I mean, that's not where it, where it started, but that's definitely where it's, where it's going. Uh, I started in the film industry, but things took a, an amazing turn uh, about three and a half years ago. And... Uh, yeah, I'm 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 excited about it. That sounds awesome. Um, so I, I think I read somewhere that that at your biggest you were around 300 pounds. Um, growing up, what kind of expectations did you have of food and and of a healthy lifestyle? What did that mean to you? Well, I mean, I grew up. Uh, you know, my 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 father is one of the uh, the founders of Whole Foods Market, and so I grew up in Texas. Texas healthy food, I guess. Uh, so it was, there was a lot of meat. There was, um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, fried food and stuff like that, but it, I wasn't allowed to have like all the junk food and stuff like that in the house. And, you know, my dad, uh, was very, very critical of the way people ate and took care of themselves. Um, because he, he lost his father, uh, to cancer when he was 25 years old. And so he has a, a fear of people that he's really close with um, hurting themselves or becoming sick by their own actions and, you know, losing them. So he was very hypercritical of the way that I took care of myself. And when, I'm very, when you're very little, that can have an adverse effect on you. It can, you know, when you're 10 years old and your, your dad is saying, you know, things like moment on the lips, forever on the hips. And, uh, you know, that, that food is bad food. You don't eat that stuff you know, sometimes you internalize it as, well, if it's bad food and I like it, does that make me bad? And so I always felt like my self-image never measured up to what he was, to his expectations. And so growing up, I kind of had um, difficulty with self-image issues. So, um, yeah, it started at a young age, but, you know, that was just my inability to understand uh, his, the way he was choosing to show his love for me, which was, those things that you're doing, I'm afraid, are going to make you sick. And I love you, so please don't do that. Instead, it was, don't eat that stuff, it's bad. And how did that poor self-image kind of develop as you got older, maybe as you got out of the house um, and a, you know, got into your 20s? Well, you know, certainly going through uh, puberty uh, and, you know, when you, when you really become aware of how you look and it, and it becomes an issue... It, it certainly became worse. I was never really proud of uh, of who I was and 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 what I looked like physically. Um, but uh, and, and so it became issue. I always thought that you know I was never out of shape, but I always thought that I wasn't okay looking. Um, and so I kind of uh, I was prescribed Adderall in high school and discovered that if you take a lot of it. It gives you an amazing ability, one, to, uh, you know, become a type A personality. It's sort of like putting your brain on steroids. The other thing is that it is, it is, it's an amphetamine, and so it can control your weight. And so that was another reason why, you know, I started my addiction to Adderall in high school. Um, and it got really out of control in, in college to where, you know, the average prescription dosage is something like 20 to 60 milligrams a day. Uh, at my worst, I was taking something like 400 milligrams a day. So that's a that's a pretty insane number, even for people who know the the drug. 400 milligrams is a lot, um, and uh, you know that 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 basically became my entire life was: uh, Do I have more Adderall? If I don't have more Adderall, where am I going to get it? Um, I was basically living as a recluse in my apartment, and at the same time, I developed a, an addiction to fast food. Which came, I mean, I guess you can say it was kind of like a, you know, an F you to the old man. You know, like uh, I was never allowed to have this when I was a little kid. So now I'm just going to do whatever the hell I want. 
I mean, maybe that played into it a little bit, but, you know, I can't say for sure. Uh, but I certainly, it got out of control. My weight reached, you know, 300 pounds by the time I was, you know, 20, 26 years old. I think I read somewhere that, that also something that was pretty big was depression. Where did that come from? And, and maybe at what point did that begin to creep in? I mean, I, I would say that I suffered with, with, with some mild depression growing up. Um, and I don't really know where it's from. Maybe it, it stems from issues that, that come from the, the, what I talked about earlier with my dad and my self image. But, um, the problem with Adderall is that it is, like I said, it's an amphetamine. And so you go on these, these highs and lows constantly during the day. And that, that plays into your, um, um, you know, your, uh, your, your emotional state. And whether or not you're going to be able to uh, to regulate your uh, your mood, and if you're on a chemically induced bipolar uh, situation, which is what Adderall does, then yeah, it's gonna it's gonna worsen your depression. When did you realize that you that you had a problem with addiction? Um, was there a rock bottom moment, and you realized that you needed help and you couldn't do it on your own? Yeah, you know, uh, like I mentioned before, my addiction had had uh, gotten to a point to where I existed primarily in my apartment. Um, it, my life was about how do I get more drugs? If I don't have it, I'll go get fast food and eat myself into a food coma and then sleep for you know how, however many days until I can get more drugs. And I had no self worth. I had no you know passion for life. Uh, my apartment looked like one of those apartments from that show Hoarders. I don't, I'm sure you've at least seen clips of that show. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember that I was spending all my money on drugs. And one day I was sitting there and I looked, you know, about a month down the road and said, wow, I'm not going to have money for rent. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was going to be living on the street. And, you know, I grew up in a fortunate situation and I knew that I didn't have the skills to survive on the street. And my dad had reached out a few times saying, you know, what's going on? There's clearly clearly something going on with you. Your, your weight's getting out of control. You're unhealthy. You're unhappy. You know, you're not working. You know, if it, if it isn't at one point he thought I had maybe had a gambling addiction. Uh, you know, it, he said, if you have an addiction, don't be ashamed of it. You know, uh, you can get help and, and it's not a problem. And because he had done that a few times, uh, I'm, I, I'm fairly certain that that's the reason why that morning I picked up the phone and I called him and I just said, you know, I really need some help. Um, you know, I, I, I need to go somewhere. And uh, he knew exactly what I was talking about. And he said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And two weeks later, I was in. Uh, I checked into Sierra Tucson, which is an inpatient rehab facility in uh, Tucson, Arizona. Wow. And so, what did life look like in the sober living facility? I mean, I'm just imagining you going in, used to eating terrible food, uh, used to having, you know, drugs. It sounds like constantly. What did that look like whenever you got there? Okay. Well, so I went into uh, to rehab. Uh, for 37 days before I moved into sober living, um, and when I when I checked into rehab in, in Tucson, Arizona, uh, the first day you go into an area called MAS, uh, which is a medical uh, sort of quarantine area where they do all your medical tests, you do a physical, uh, they strip search you, that whole thing. It's it's for the it's for your safety and for the safety of everyone else that's in rehab to make sure that they know what you're dealing with, if you have any undiagnosed conditions. Um, and, and the other thing is, no one shows up to rehab sober. Everybody shows up on whatever it is their drug of choice is. So I showed up like really, really high on Adderall. And so there's, all, there's also that. They want you to spend at least 24 hours to get whatever's in your system out of your system before you go uh, into, I guess, where everyone else is. And what I found out day one, uh, was that I was a type 2 diabetic. And I have no idea how long it had been undiagnosed. I know that for a, a while there, uh, I was, you know, having to, to urinate constantly and I had to, I was just constantly thirsty. I could not drink enough water. And those are typical symptoms of someone who's an undiagnosed diabetic. And that, that diagnosis hit me harder than the, the fact that I was an addict and the fact that I was depressed because 
uh, I couldn't deny it. You know, I could say things like, oh, well, you know, I take a lot of Adderall because, oh, you know, I'm so macho and I have such a high tolerance for this stuff. And, and that's, that's the reason why. And, you know, I could say, well, it's not my fault I'm depressed. The world has screwed me over so many times. But when you're a type 2 diabetic and you understand the disease, and I had attended uh, Rip Esselstyn's Engine 2 immersion, which is a health immersion about plant-based nutrition and its ability to reverse disease. And they talk a lot about type 2 diabetes. So I understood the nature of the disease, and I understood that you don't get that disease unless you give it to yourself. So I had to accept responsibility for my situation in life for the first time ever. I couldn't blame anyone else or anything else for this diagnosis except myself. But that was also that was also a really pivotal moment because because I knew that I could reverse it with plant based nutrition. I remember saying to myself, "Well, if I'm the cause of this, if my diet caused this, then my diet can also fix it." So in a sense, if I'm the cause of my problems, I get to be the solution. I don't have to wait for anyone else. I don't have to wait for anything else. I could just start today, switch my diet to plant-based, and reverse this, this situation. And there was an actual enemy to fight. There was a number on a page. It was trackable. I could take my blood sugar readings and see how the progress was happening. I could see my weight coming off. With the intangible things like depression and addiction, there's no number. They can't say, oh, you're this much depressed today and you're this much depressed tomorrow or that you're this much of an addict today and this much of an addict tomorrow. And that's difficult for someone who really needs to see improvement in order to feel self-worth. And without self-worth, you really don't feel like you're worth saving. It's a really important thing to develop in recovery. And that's why, you know, uh, these things like your your biometrics can be very, very powerful medicine in, in recovery. So... uh that's what I did. Unfortunately, in rehab, you don't have a lot of control over what you eat. I mean, they had it was it was a nice facility. They had really nice food, but it's not like I had a lot of vegan options. So I ate as best I could. But when I when I checked out and went into sober living in California, I was going to make it my goal to use that as my sort of test center, my 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 laboratory to reverse the disease. But I remember walking in day one and seeing the pantry and seeing the refrigerator and it's just sodas and fruity pebbles and microwavable pizzas and Eggo waffles and Doritos. I mean, literally like a teenager from the 80s or 90s had stocked this this place and said, this will be good. And I remember thinking that if I had not attended the immersion a few years before and didn't know about plant-based nutrition, if I walked in and saw everyone else there eating those foods and seeing that they were still sober and still, you know, progressing, I would think that's the right thing to do. I would think that's what I need to do to be sober. I need to eat like that and and, and it's okay. Uh, and it's so not because, yeah, these people are sober, but there's no way anybody comes into a facility like that and leaves a healthier person. They may be sober, but they're not healthier. Sobriety is just abstinence. It's not, it's not recovery. Recovery and sobriety are two different things. You can have sobriety without recovery, but you can't have recovery without sobriety. Um, so recovery is more about creating a new way of living where your addiction no longer comes into play in your life. You've created a way of life that's so far removed from your destructive lifestyle that you know your, the way that you move through the world doesn't bring about temptation and doesn't bring about your addiction. And... Uh, and so I remember I talked to the house manager and said, I'm a type 2 diabetic. I can't eat the foods that are in here. I need to uh, get – at the time, I wasn't really too keen on switching from McDonald's to, to kale. Um, so I said, I want oatmeal for, for mornings and get as much leafy green vegetables as you can and fruit. And then for the first few months, I, I did egg white scrambles. So I could sort of get a taste for the vegetables, and I ate that every day for for uh, you know for ten months, and I took down the uh, the egg whites, you know, as as we went along until it was just you know a pure vegan diet. But what happened was I reversed my type two diabetes in about three months. In ten months, I lost a hundred pounds. I went off of seven medications, and that's that is such a, a powerful. Uh, powerful evidence of what that diet does. If medication is an indication of disease in the body, because that's what medication is for, it treats disease. 
then going off of medication while in recovery is an indication that your treatment is actually working. If you're going through recovery and being put on more and more medicines, and that should be evidence to you that your recovery really isn't working, you're becoming a sicker person, and uh, that something needs to change. And I saw so many people come into sober living eating these foods and going on more medications and gaining weight and becoming more depressed. And it's such a disservice that nutrition, and in my opinion, plant-based nutrition, isn't focused and it isn't taught as part of your recovery. I mean, you go to any AA meeting tonight, and I guarantee there's going to be three things there. There's going to be coffee, there's going to be donuts, and there's going to be cigarettes. And all three of them are addiction, addictive, all three of them are drugs, and all three of them will destroy your life. And yet these things are sort of promoted as at least you're not doing your drug. Well, I'm sorry, but in a, in a world where we have a relapse rate of 90%, the system's broken, and maybe we need to think that just being off of your drug isn't the same thing as being recovered. So, you know, I, uh, I really think that plant-based nutrition, in my opinion, should be at the heart of all, all recovery because the, the standard American diet is substance abuse. And uh, it's full of foods that will, that will destroy your life. So, I'm re- I, I mean, I'm really passionate about it. I know I kind of went on and on there, but... Uh, no, that's all, that's all fantastic. It's, it's crazy to think about going to a place where you're being, you're being treated for addiction, but yet some of your other addictions maybe that aren't as uh, quote-unquote clinical or, or as, uh, so served so easily. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it's almost pushed on you. It's almost like, you know, do what you have to do so that you're not doing your illegal drug or your socially unacceptable drug because – you know, at least you're not doing those if you're eating your fruity pebbles and you're eating your, you know, microwavable pizzas, which are all chemical based, uh, uh, artificially created addictive substances that create disease in the body. That, that is every parameter that's necessary to define a drug. The only difference is it's not illegal. So yeah, I, I don't understand it. Yeah. And once you, once you got into the sober living facility and you started to change your, I know you said you're basically able to, to reverse your diabetes. Can you talk yeah. about the difference in how you felt physically from the point at which you, you know, maybe you went in and you were, you were still kind of at your lowest of your low to how you felt physically, um, through that process of, of, of introducing more plants and then uh, eventually where you, you know, came to where you are now? Yeah. Um, you know, when I first got started, I was, I didn't feel very good about myself. And, and, you know, like I said, I, I, I was a person who went to McDonald's four times a day, uh, to now eating oatmeal, kale and fruit and, and egg whites. And, and I remember thinking, you know, that, that I hated this every single day. And the way that I had to look at it was I have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable in order to recover. And if I get up every single day and I, I make these foods for myself, um, it may not be a comfortable thing to do, but it's what I need to do. And the act of preparing a meal that you know is going to promote health and wellness in your life, that you know is going to make you a better version of yourself today than you were the day before, that's an act of self-care. That's an act of self-love. And those are the actions of a person who's sober and wants to recover. And so while I may not have enjoyed it, and there were days when everyone was watching football and I and they were eating their pizza because we had every every Friday and Saturday night at Sober Living they ordered out pizza, and they were watching football and they were eating their pizza and drinking their soda, and I wanted to do that with them, and I would be crying while I was eating my kale salad, but it was you know I knew that this was what I had to do, and as the weight came off, it became more about not needing to get pleasure from these, you know, super uh, concentrated foods, but rather reaching these goals that I was seeing myself achieve and, and seeing myself become someone new in the mirror. And the day that my blood sugar, which started at over 300, uh, hit, you know, the high 60s, because I was still on the metformin, and I started feeling hypoglycemic. And I just threw the medicine in the trash. I mean, that that was maybe one of the greatest feelings I've ever had in my life because I, I proved to myself that I am not the victim of circumstance, 
that I am completely in control of my life. And even if a doctor says, here's a medicine you're going to be on for the rest of your life. So I remember the doctor at rehab, I, I said, you know, is it possible for someone to get off of this medicine? He goes, well, you know, Adam, I think that if you work really, really hard, maybe in like three years, two or three years, you might be able to get off that medicine. And here I am at month three, throwing the medicine in the trash, not even talking to the doctor, and then going to the doctor three months later and him saying, wow, you're, you know, your blood sugar looks great. I think we can cut your medicine down by half. And I said, you know, I don't think we need to do that. I just stopped taking it. And he said, well, why would you stop taking it? He said, I went plant-based. And he looked at me and he, and, he, and he told me, well, I guess that makes sense. And I, you know, it's just like if you knew that information, why would you not share it? And I wanted to get angry at him for, for that. But at the same time, he's a doctor. He's a medical doctor. He treats disease with medicine. That's his job. And that it is the job of the, you know, the individual to educate themselves as to every possibility for recovery. But I do resent the fact that, uh, you know, addiction recovery, a place that's supposed to give you every opportunity to change your life for the better, didn't have someone to tell me, if you don't want to be on the medicine for the rest of your life, you can do this, you can eat these foods and get off of it. If I hadn't had that information already that I, that I learned from Rip Esselstyn, I wouldn't have known that and no one would have told me. And I, and I wouldn't be here today talking to you. And that's, that's, that's a disservice. Well, it sounds like um, that you're doing something about that resentment actively. But before we get there, I'm just curious, did you, you know, I know obviously you have the physical, um, like just by sight that changed, how you're feeling changed. But I also realized that we're all still human. Did you put some yeah. structures in place to kind of prevent relapses with drugs or with previous ways of eating, of, of living in place so that, um, you know, whether it was accountability or just, you know, distance, um, how did, what did you do to prevent yourself from going back? Well, you know, one of the things that I think really helped was that I didn't move back to Austin. Um, that I'm, I, when I, I moved into sober living in California, uh, and I moved out after 10 months, I purposely stayed in California because this was an environment where every uh, everything around me was a trigger for recovery. Um, the places that I would go running in the morning or walking in the morning, the, the sights around the city, everything reminded me of my recovery. Whereas back in Austin, all this, my old stomping grounds were where my addiction thrived. So being in that environment would sort of bring up emotional triggers about you know, relapse and wanting to use. So this was a new environment that I created for myself that was all about recovery. And so I knew I wanted to stay there. But as far as, you know, sticking to the food, I, I, you know, I wish I knew exactly how I was able to switch overnight. And I could tell people the the thing is that I remember, I remember saying to myself that, you know, this is, this is very serious. I was a very, very sick person. And if that means I can't have another cheeseburger for the rest of my life in order to become happy and healthy, happier and healthier than I've ever been, then that's just got to be my reality and I need to accept it and move forward and, and not worry about whether or not I'm ever going to have a cheeseburger again, but celebrate the fact that I'm becoming a person I've never been before. Because there's this idea that's sort of, uh, it's not really talked about, but it, it's like this unwritten idea in, in, in uh, addiction recovery that you're sort of going back to the person you were before your drug addiction started or the person you were but without your drug addiction. And that's, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that dr that recovery from substance abuse is, a big, is about becoming someone you've never been. And if you're constantly trying to go back to someone that you were before, you're never fully aware of who you're becoming. And so, yeah, I mean, I could, I could, you know, feel bad about the fact that I don't get to eat meat anymore or eat junk food anymore. And, and I am really strict on my diet. And some people say, well, you, you know, what are you going to live like that for the rest of your life? Yes, I am. And, and, and I love it. I love it now. At first I didn't, I wasn't excited about it because I'd never lived that way, but I've, I've allowed myself the opportunity to discover how amazing it is. And, uh, I never want to go back. Yeah. So. It's funny sometimes how there's, there people have the idea that it's almost like they're fearful for you on what you're missing out on. 
But once yeah. you realize what you had been missing out on for all those years in your life, you realize that it's not it's not something worth trading. Um, so maybe maybe we can just go into talking about what you're doing now, where you're hoping to to be. You know, uh, I know you're. It sounds like you're working with uh, recovery um, with people in addiction recovery now, and uh, maybe talk about what you're doing, where you're headed, where you see yourself in five years. So right now I work in addiction recovery in, in California. I work at a place called the Canyon Santa Monica, which is an intensive outpatient therapy center. It's essentially a rehab facility, but you don't live there. You go four to five days a week, either during the day uh, or at night. Like say, say if someone has to work during the day, they attend their groups at night. They get drug tested there. They do their process groups. And, then, and I run a group there where our focus is on, it's called holistic recovery. And it's really about focusing on the smaller actions that you do during the day, your everyday actions and how those everyday actions like feeding yourself can actually pr- promote recovery in your life. And it, and it can actually improve your recovery program instead of saying, oh, well, you know, I'm in recovery right now. I can't have my drugs, so I'm just going to eat whatever I want. You know, that's that, that's a recipe for disaster because it's going to make you sicker and it's going to your depression is probably going to worsen. And when those when that, when you create an environment that doesn't allow for remarkable change, you know, it, it, like I say, it's a disservice. I think that there was a, a Ted talk by a guy named Simon Sinek who said, when the environment is right, uh, everyone has the capacity for remarkable change. And that's really in a sense what I did for myself. I created an environment where every single one of my actions was allowing me to change for the better. I made all of my, you know, my previous lifestyle was an addiction to, uh, a, a destructive lifestyle, destructive addiction. Well, I'm very much addicted to this lifestyle. It is as as strong of an uh, of an addiction as my previous lifestyle. Only this one, everything is about a productive lifestyle that's moving me forward. So yeah, I'm still an addict, but all my addictions are productive, and that's what I want to teach to people. And I see plant based nutrition as an amazing way to create a new version of yourself that you can be proud of and and feel better than you've ever felt in your life. It's not a cure-all, absolutely not, but it is definitely, at, at the very least, whether or not you are able to stay sober for the rest of your life, you will be healthier than you've ever been. And when you're healthier than you've ever been, you're, the way your medications affect you uh, changes, the way that you uh, are able to think and to feel emotions and process emotions changes. And, and that's, a, that's a huge benefit to someone in recovery. And... Uh, so I'm trying to develop for the very first time. I, I don't know. It may exist. I haven't seen it or, or heard of anything, but a truly plant-based recovery track, a recovery program where when you come in to the program, you, you adopt a plant-based lifestyle, and that is mandatory. And we see what happens. Just like with, with any other recovery program, you have your IOP, you have your therapy sessions, you have your medications, but the, the goal is not to stay on them. It's to be on them for a necessary amount of time and to get off of your med- medications and become, you know, a person that you've never been before. And, and I'm working on that with some amazing people. Um, and hopefully within five years, you know, we'll have a, a recovery center that is a whole foods plant-based addiction recovery center. And you could, I, I think it would be great if it's open to people who have drug addictions or just any person who doesn't feel like they're, they're living a healthy lifestyle and wants to learn a plant-based uh, lifestyle can come and check in and, and and get these amazing resources and learn this amazing lifestyle and take charge of their life, take charge of their health because it's in it's completely in your hands. If if you want to be the happiest, healthiest version of yourself that you've ever been, it's not up to someone else to do it. It's up to you, and that's the best news that you can hear. So we'll see what happens. That sounds fantastic, and it sounds like there's a there's a huge need for it. Um, I know that. I know that you mentioned to me, and I think I saw a little bit online about that you invited your brother to come and live with you earlier this year. Um, can yeah. you talk about kind of uh, what that looked like and what that looks like now and what led to that point, just uh, if I wasn't familiar with it? Okay, so my brother, uh, he's a filmmaker. He was living in Austin, Texas. He's my twin. Um, and he was very much where I was three years ago, minus the addiction. He, um, he was 250 pounds. He was a type 2 diabetic. Uh, he's depressed. He was on medications. 
And for the better part of a year, I had been, you know, throwing this idea around in my head that I really want to ask him, you know, to come and move in with me in LA and live my lifestyle and see what happens. But I'm very codependent with him because I treated him very poorly when I was an addict and I don't want to, you know, I didn't want to offend him and, and all that stuff. And, but I remember I was sitting in the, uh, in the airport in Philadelphia with him and I just said, just ask him, just ask him. And I, and I looked over and I said, Bobby, I got to ask you something and, and I'm not judging you or your lifestyle, but are you happy with where you are in life physically and emotionally? Are you happy? And he said, no. And I said, well, well, how about this? Come move in with me in, 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 in LA, live my lifestyle for six months, live a plant-based lifestyle for six months. You can put cameras all over my apartment. I don't care. Um, make a documentary out of it. Let's see what happens to you just for six months. And, you know, we'll get you off your medications and, and we'll see what happens. It'll be a cool thing. You know, we're twins. We're very close. Uh, it's an interesting idea. And, and amazingly, he said yes. So, uh, at the very, I think it was the 28th of December, uh, there was that blizzard that was going on, uh, in West Texas and, and New Mexico. And, and he literally got rid of his apartment, got rid of his, he sold his car and he loaded up all this stuff into a U-Haul and drove 20 straight hours through the blizzard all the way to LA. And when he called me at like three in the morning, the next day, I thought he had stopped and, and was just getting an early start. And uh, I said, all right, man, so what, I'll see you like around one o'clock today. He goes, no, I'm at your front door. And uh, I was like, yeah, okay, man, I'll see you in like, I'll see you in like 10 hours. And then I heard him knock, he's like, come open the door. And so we went and we met with, uh, with Dr. Matt Letterman, who was the doctor in Forks Over Knives. Uh, and he runs the Whole Foods Market Wellness Center in Glendale. And we talked to him about what we're doing. And uh, he said, well, if this is the diet you're going to be on and this is the program you're going to be on, then you don't need this anymore. And he took Bobby's metformin, which is a, a type 2 diabetes medication, and he threw it away, and uh, which is an amazing thing because his blood sugar without the type 2 diabetes medication was 300, just like mine was. And so essentially what Matt Letterman was saying was that these medications aren't as powerful as the food you're going to be eating, so you don't need them. The food is going to be doing more for you than these medications have ever done. And in, uh, I think, one week, his uh, his blood sugar, or in three weeks, his blood sugar went from 300 to 150. So it dropped 150 points. It was actually lower than it had ever been on the medications. When he was on his medications, his blood sugar was about 180. So in three weeks, his blood sugar dropped to the lowest it had ever been without medicine. His blood pressure went from 140 over 100 to 120 over 80. So he was prehypertensive, almost high blood pressure risk for heart attack. And now his blood pressure was normal. And in three months, he's lost 40 pounds. He's now the lightest he's been in 10 years. So in three months, he's reversed his type 2 diabetes. He's reversed his high blood pressure. He's lost 40 pounds. He eats more now than he ever ate when he was three hundred when he was two hundred and fifty pounds. And, you know, it's it's just it's incredible. And what's amazing is that, you know, th these numbers sound too good to be true. But the fact is, you talk to somebody who's done a plant based journey, this is the standard. When you stick to it a hundred percent, and that's the thing I, I you know, I have to credit him for is, is that he really took it on uh in the same fashion that I did. And I said, when you do this, there are no cheats. We don't do cheat meals, you know, because cheat meals are going back to the way that you used to live and damaging your body. And I don't, I don't see the benefit in rewarding yourself by damaging yourself. And he hasn't cheated and he eats exactly, you know, the way that, uh, that I, that I plan for him to eat, which is a whole foods plant-based diet. And you can see the results. It's amazing. I mean, the fact that in, within the next three weeks he's going to be under 200 pounds is just unbelievable. And uh, it's, you know, I told him, I said, listen, because we struggled the first week because I wanted him to come. I do circuit training at this amazing gym called Base Camp Fitness. Um, and it's, it's kind of like CrossFit, but uh, it's not under the CrossFit label. Um, and it has this amazing community feel and we've got great trainers there and, 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 uh, I wanted him to come in there. The, the, the problem with 
well, I guess you could say it's a problem and a benefit uh, that the physical training has is that it's very revealing. You can't hide from it. It shows you exactly where you are. And when he used to be a, uh, an athlete in high school, he played varsity tennis. And when he got into the gym and he, he really got his ass kicked uh, the first workout, it really upset him. And I said, Bobby, I want to talk to you a little bit. You know, you kind of shut down in the gym. You know, do you want to talk about what's going on? And he didn't want to talk about it. And I said, you know, that's fine if you don't want to talk about it. But until you do, we're not going to get past this. And I'll tell you right now that regardless of whether this documentary that, you're, that we're making is successful or not, I don't care about that. I just want you to be successful and to reverse your type 2 diabetes. And, you know, that's the thing. He didn't let it, let it stop him. He wasn't ready to talk about it, but he didn't stop he kept doing what he needed to do because the emotional change takes longer, but he didn't quit. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's on his way to becoming someone that he's never been before. And it's exciting for me to watch. And I'm insanely proud of him because he's gotten past that, that first three weeks of where you are losing weight, but you can't see it in yourself, you know, cause it takes like 10 weeks for you to see change in yourself. And usually about the three-week mark is when people say, well, I don't see any weight loss. I've been doing this. It's miserable. I'm just going to quit. And he stuck with it. And that's, that's, the, that's the part where I talked about you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And he's doing that on a daily basis. And that's why he's recovering. So it's been, it's been amazing. Yeah, what an incredible opportunity and, uh, and story. And I will certainly look forward to hearing where that, where that brings you both. Um, and what a gift, uh, I guess, both for you and for him. Um, yeah. So if you, if you were to give some advice to someone who is at the start of this journey, who's hearing this and is saying, I want to make a change, you know, this, this all makes sense to me, or, you know, maybe they have diabetes, they're wanting to do something about it, or, or just extra weight, or maybe they show up to the gym and they can't do what they thought they once could, or, um, you know, whatever it might be, what advice would you give to someone who's, who's, who hasn't even started yet? Um, okay. Maybe some hope uh, that, you know, that there is light at the end of the tunnel and that, that they can make a change? Well, I'll say, you know, if, if it is about, um, you know, wanting to reverse diabetes or lose weight or just feel better in general, um, I'm going to speak from my experience and my experience is, is with, uh, plant-based nutrition. Um, that there's amazing resources out there. There's engine2diet.com. There's johnmcdougall.com. There's, uh, Amazing doctors out there like Joel Furman and Dean Ornish, um, Rip Esselstyn, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Rip is, you know, my mentor. He's, you know, been an incredible uh, impact on my life. And um, these people offer you a way to reverse your disease uh, and become something you've never been before. It's not going to be easy. Um, and that is that. It can seem scary at first, but, you know, it's very true when you say if you really want something you never had before, you got to be willing to do something you've never done before. And like I said, when, I, when we were talking earlier, I mentioned that there were days when I was crying because I was so uncomfortable with what I was having to do on a daily basis. But it's so worth it. And, you know, I think the best thing you can do is educate yourself. Um and surround yourself with people and and uh, and resources that that allow you to change. Um, so if it's about making diet changes, you know, get rid of all the bad stuff that's in your house and bring good food into your house. Because when there's good food in your house, you eat good food. Um, it, whereas if you're going out every day to find healthy food and eat it out, and then come back to your place where there's junk food, you're still going to eat the junk food in your house. Um, and there's amazing support groups online that, that can support you through it, but it's, it, it, you know, there's no magic trick. There's no secret to doing it. You just have to do it. And that's, that's, that makes it difficult, but that also makes it, uh, completely in your control. And like I said before, when, when you're the cause of your problems, you get to be the solution. So take charge of your life and your health and, you know, educate yourself and, and you can do it. I mean, that's the, the thing is that I'm not I'm not so special and so unique that this could only work on me. And if it worked on me, it can work on anybody if it if it you know, and, and that's 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 a fact that 
you know, uh, I didn't, I didn't have any other advantage physically that anyone else doesn't have. So if I can do it, you can do it. And it just, you just have to do it one day at a time. Don't worry about never having to eat meat for the rest of your life. You only have to eat this way today. Do that every day and, and you'll reach your goal. That's all awesome. And, uh, anything that you think for yourself personally would have helped if you could go back and give yourself some advice, uh, whenever you were first starting the journey. I, I mean, I guess I could, I, the thing is like, if I had gone back and given my old self advice, I, I would tell my new self to go fuck off. So, <laughs> cause I was this angry entitled person. Uh, but you know, the thing is that my journey is the way it is and, and, and it happened in a way that I wouldn't want to change. But I guess I would say, you know, I would, I think that the essence of recovery is just, is getting up every day and not doing what you want to do, but doing what you need to do. And that is the search for the authentic self comes from a very uncomfortable place and you have to meet yourself in that un uncomfortable place to move forward. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a very personal journey and it's, and it's a very difficult journey, but it's the greatest journey I've ever made in my life. So, you know, I would just go back and, and tell him that you're, you're doing the right thing and frustrations are normal, but just keep doing what you're doing. Awesome. And then I guess lastly, where can people find out more about you, what you're doing and connect? Uh, well, you can, uh, I have a website that's, it's, it's, up it's it has uh, some resources it's slowly being worked on but it's called sudbrothers.com it's it's chronicling uh my journey through plant-based recovery and my brothers uh as well as my quest to uh integrate plant-based nutrition into addiction recovery uh you can find me on instagram at adam sud 82 um and on facebook adam sud and uh yeah so that that's about it. I did give out my phone number on the Ritual podcast, but I've learned not to do that anymore. <laughs> I think that's smart. Um, well, first off, just want to say thanks. Uh, thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for being, you know, honest and transparent. And uh, and congratulations on on your sobriety, on your change, on everything you're doing to help other people change their life. And um, I really appreciate the time that you've you given me, and look forward to chatting with you soon. Thank you so much. I really appreciate, you know, when I reached out to you, you getting back to me and everything, because I think that what you're doing is, is, is awesome. This film is going to help a lot of people. Appreciate it. Well, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.